Welcome to the Forgiven Nutritionist Podcast. Today, I'm talking with Amy Janowski. She is a sister of the soil and tender of the table. And in 2014, she started Amy's Acre, a market garden that grows fresh vegetables from the Milwaukee Metro and Racine County area. Amy's Acre became her primary workplace in 2019. Amy is driven to grow good food by a deep-seated belief that how good food is grown determines its nourishing potential. She cultivates with integrity and intention and learns best by thinking critically, asking questions, observing her surroundings, and using her body to do the work. Here's a clip from today's show. It's like one of the more rewarding things about um, having egg layers. Um, I, well, I just think that chickens have like a lot of personality and like the, they're, they're so curious and they really are like, they're the best at like greeting every day, like the new day that it is, you know, it's like they come out of that coop every day and it's like, Oh, I better check over here. I better check over there. You know, it's like, it doesn't matter that they've checked that yesterday, probably six times or, you know, they just, I don't know. There's something about their way. That's just like sort it's uplifting and it's positive and it's curious. And I think that those are good, characteristics for everybody to <laughs> maintain as best as possible um and then I also I, I mean I like having the the eggs here for our use and for for sale and um I you know it, it's just amazing to me how for a small animal like what a nutritious food they can produce and um uh, I like being able to offer that that protein to people too. Um, and yeah, I don't it is a great cognitive multivitamin. It's, it's great for your brains. Hey everyone, just a quick break to show some gratitude to our sponsors and give you some special deals. Are you looking for a good probiotic seed DS one daily symbiotic has both prebiotic and probiotic. It supports digestive health, heart health, skin health, and gut health, including those who suffer with IBS. Their products are clinically studied and third-party tested for quality, and I think you'll be impressed with their eco-friendly packaging. Click the link in the show notes and use my code FORGIVEN for 15% off your first month's supply. Thank you so much for joining us today, Amy. How are you tonight? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited you're here as well. Why don't you tell my listeners a little bit about yourself and how you ended up in the regenerative space? Sure. Um, so, uh, currently my husband and I have a 20 acre farm here in Southeastern Wisconsin and on our property, we raise about two acres of vegetables. We have 300 laying hens and then we have about 12 acres of pasture and, um, some other space that is sort of in the midst of new management. Um, and my background, um, this, this year was my 10th season farming. Um, it's my, it was my fifth year running my own business, um, as my only source of employment. Um, the first five years I worked on my own farm as well as managing another farm. And I did not grow up farming. Um, I grew up in a small town in Western Wisconsin, but both of my parents, um, are from farming families, dairy farm families. And so the, I guess you could say the seed was planted early on, um, in terms of agriculture as a career opportunity. Um, My undergraduate degree is in horticulture and soil science. um, And after college, I interned on a few different farms before settling in this area. And uh, mostly by just being in the right place at the right time and knowing the right people, I was able to access land and get my own business off the ground. That's great. I I did not realize that your parents had uh, a dairy farm. They, we didn't have a dairy farm. They both grew up on dairy farms themselves. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So, oh, and okay. those those pieces of property are still in the extended family, um, not actively being well, sort of actively being farmed, but not as sole income earners for those individuals. Okay, great. I think that a lot of people um, don't really when they think of a farm, they think of the typical farm, you know, with the barn and the big tractors and the plows and and um, you know, all the rows of corn or soy. And so um, I know that when I talk to people about uh, the little farm that Dave and I have, (laughs) 
um, and our chickens, um, they don't really realize that you don't have to have all of that stuff. Uh So, um, you know, we just have the house and we have a shed and yes, we have our garage. (laughs) Um, And so you don't always need uh, some of that stuff, uh, all that overhead also, especially when in the regenerative space, you don't need a lot of that stuff. So um, what what are some of the things that are on your farm that maybe people might be surprised about? Um, Well, yeah, I I really like how you put it because we have none of those... (laughs) those sort of landmarks on our farm in terms there's no big red barn or anything like that um Mm -hmm. we have uh, a machine shed um that i uh, sort of started out as my husband's man cave when he first brought the property before i was in the picture um but we do have that um building that we use to store equipment so that might be the most traditional aspect of our farm we have um two hoop houses uh which are essentially steel structures with a plastic sheeted roof um, that allow me to extend the growing season. Um, So I have a little bit better control of temperature and water in those situations. Um, And that's what allows me to have um, thawed ground earlier in the year and as well as later into the season to have crops growing. Um, We also use one of those spaces as housing for our chickens in the winter time. Um, because we don't have any outbuildings for livestock, we've just had to make use with the resources available to us. And the hoop house was the the first thing that we started um, sort of giving a dual purpose to when we started raising chickens. Um, we do have one small tractor that I use for uh, primary tillage in the spring. And then most of my work in terms of vegetables is done by hand. So I have a wide variety of different types of hoes and hand tools and different cedars that are pushed just with with my own body and my own hands. Um, And then I have a small pickup truck to move produce from the field over to my wash station. Um, My wash station is a shipping container that was cut in half. (laughs) Um, And then it just has a couple of 50 or yeah, 55 gallon plastic tubs that are usually used for livestock watering, but I use them to wash vegetables in. They're just on um, sawhorses. And then I have an old washing machine in there that I use to spin and dry um, salad greens and other produce. And I have um, seasonally available water in that space that we had to, we actually did bury some lines, but they're not very deep enough to have winter or water all year round. Um, and that's pretty much it. So our, our infrastructure is pretty simple and relatively low overhead. Although, um, the hoop houses are not what I, they're not the most inexpensive item out there. Um, so those came into the picture a little bit later because one of my goals was to grow the business and grow the operation without taking on debt. And so, so far we've been able to do that. That's great. And so um, I know that um, because I, I'm in the healthcare industry, a lot of people don't really think about, and I know before I got here, um, I definitely never thought about um, how what I ate really mattered as far as my health goes. And I definitely never thought about how what I was eating, what they were eating really mattered <laughs> either. And so um, now I know a lot and, and I know that, you know, if you are eating, you know, whether it's eggs or the meat from a chicken or the meat from, you know, any livestock really, uh, cattle or anything. Um, if you're, if they're not a healthy animal, that in then turn is going to um, literally feed into your health and either help continue your health or help your health decline. So um, I know that uh, regenerative farming is really one of the things that really shed a light as far as health. Cause I, like I said, I never thought about any of that, you know, growing up, it's not taught in uh, at least the school that I went to. I don't remember learning anything about that. So why don't you tell us um, a little bit about how regenerative practices kind of different from differ from conventional farming methods. Cause again, I know that most people are familiar with, you know, the rows of corn and you have to have the big tractors and till that, you know, certain times of the year and then at certain times of the year it gets cut down and 
or you leave certain things up. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the differences between what you do in regenerative versus the traditional farming? Sure. Um, I have to say, like, I, I feel like I kind of um, backed into regenerative agriculture without kind of really knowing that what I was doing was called by some by other people as regenerative. Um, I, w I just, um, a when I started out on this property, I just started with practices that I had learned through doing and being on other farms and working for other farms. Um, so what that means for me is the input, the off-farm inputs that I use in terms of preparing ground for crops are pretty minimal um, and they're largely compost based. So I, I do purchase some um, compost from a local compost maker. I also purchase like a, a pelletized compost that's made in Ohio. Um, so, so, but those are pretty low in, um, uh, in terms of like in conventional farming, a lot of the inputs are based on the nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium constituents mm -hmm. of an input. And the inputs that I use are relatively low in those three um, nutrients. So that's that's one thing, the inputs that I use. They they pack a different kind of punch than some of the synthetically produced um, fertilizers. Well, and I know that a lot of people don't think about that too, because you touched on something that's very important, is a lot of those things that people just call fertilizer are, are synthetically made, and those can act very different, like you said, in the soil than something that's natural. And so uh, much like uh, I tell people this with probiotics and vitamins too, it's the same way. So it, it, you definitely want to keep your soil healthy. And if you have add something that's synthetic, it may help for a little while, but over time, synthetic things aren't really going to help actually regenerate and keep the health of the soil going, which is going to then continue for years and years and years to come instead of the synthetic right. things, which right. can damage the soil. Right. It's a lot of the synthetic inputs have been found to sort of, they will, they will certainly grow a crop. Like they will provide nutrition for a crop to put on biomass and get to a harvest stage. But they kind of shut down some of the processes that happen naturally between um, plants and microbes to, to cycle other nutrients in the soil. So that, so over the long term, um, yeah, to your point, they, they kind of turn the system off, um, yeah. so to speak. Um, so other, but, uh, to get back to the original question about, um, what regenerative looks like here or how I think about regenerative agriculture, what, uh, a couple of years ago I took a, I enrolled in, I went back to school <laughs> in a, in a different way, but I enrolled in a program, um, that was designed to teach, uh, people interested in the subject matter to, um, um, become regenerative agriculture coaches for other producers mm. and other farmers and ranchers because um, sometimes I I, I want to I, I like to dream about like other ways that I can apply what I've learned through farming to other parts of life and how I can bring it to people other than just food for their plate um, so that's what inspired me to pursue this program and as I was learning more about you know this thing called regenerative agriculture I, I was like oh I, I guess I'm doing a lot of these things already um, and one of the things that really stuck out was that um, the regenerative does, what it means depends on the place and the farm and the context of the farm. And so that includes the current knowledge of the producer, um, the customers who support the farm, the resources available locally, um, access information. So there's a lot of things that go into regenerative agriculture that go beyond just the practices on the land. And so, so that's um, always, that continues to be very interesting to me. Um, and then some of the more specific practices that I do on the ground that also fall under the category of regenerative would be um, trying to have a living root in the soil for as much of the year as possible. Um, that is, so pretty challenging for annual vegetable crops because a lot of the crops I grow, the whole point of growing them is to remove the entire thing, to take it for sale and to eat. Um, so that can be difficult. Um, it just requires like a little bit of 
extra forethought on my part <laughs> to think about once I pull this root out, well, how, I, how, how will I replace it most effectively and efficiently with a new seed or a new plant or something. Um, there are also, in regenerative, there's also considerations for how water is used and trying to capture rainwater and capture even irrigation water. Um, living roots can help with that because living roots help create channels in the soil for water to infiltrate and move down the soil profile rather than just running off the surface. Um, but inputs also play a role in water, so using compost, which helps build organic matter, and organic matter is, I, I consider organic matter to be basically surface area for agricultural potential, so the more, um, more organic matter your soil has and the more you're um, using inputs like compost that build organic matter and or you're using microbial, microbial inoculants to um, build organic matter, the more water you can um, hold in place over time. And, and in the opposite way, in a dry period, the more organic matter you have, the better w water retention you have as well. Um, I also think there's a huge component of regenerative agriculture that is about um, the mindset of the producer and as a ripple out from that, the mindset of the customers of that operation. Because I think that um, there's a lot of inputs that maybe aren't, there's a lot of inputs on a farm that maybe aren't recognized in a sort of scientific analysis of an agricultural system. But um, for example, like if I, if I were angry and I went out to the field and did work, I, I, I feel that that influences the end product. And so, mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, I, I'm, you'd be pretty hard pressed to find a lot of agricultural supported studies to support that. But I, I really do think that is a big part of it. And I think, um, the regenerative agricultural space is more open to those considerations, um, than maybe other categories of agriculture. You know, and it, there's something to be said for that too, because, um, I, you hear of people singing to their plants and you know i think when you go into something with a better attitude it's definitely literally going to help something grow and flourish it doesn't matter what the other life force is so yeah unfortunately like you said there's there's probably no studies for that but <laughs> no actual studies <laughs> yeah and i i feel like i've had moments where uh like one this was a few years ago it was really late in the fall and i hadn't i hadn't i still had some crops that had like you know been killed by the frost but they were hanging out and I was like I can't look at that anymore so I just went out there and I tilled and there was really no there was the intention of the tillage didn't really was not like pro rebuilding of the system it was just for me to like clean the slate of not looking at that <laughs> old crop trash and the next year those beds ha were much weedier and I you know I can't say that it was all because of that like lack of intention with that tillage but I also can't rule that out as part of mm -hmm. part of the difference so <laughs> yeah. uh, you know the this is the, that's a place for me where like the the experience and the anecdotes um kind of proof are the are all the proof or evidence needed and and it's also um I think one of the pieces of evidence for you know intention mattering comes back um in some of the things that customers say um like when people say to me like these are the best carrots i've ever had or i have a good friend who tells me over and over that my swiss chard saved her life or changed her life and you know in that case like she was not on a deathbed by any means and and i don't claim anything special or specific about that swiss chard other than like because it's a variety lots of growers grow and it's been grown for generations and you know so the only real sort of you know I guess um uh like the equivalent of like a, if I could copyright that harvest mm -hmm. or you know whatever the equivalent would be like the difference is you know that I grew it versus somebody else growing it or this land grew it versus somebody else like that's the only I don't know um I, I I just when I hear customers say those things it really feels like evidence for that that the intention of what ha the intention of the people on the land 
and how they do it and how they approach the work is is um, more maybe more meaningful than we even realize sometimes. I, I definitely agree with that. And it's perfectly said because I think that not enough people know their farmer, whether it be just for vegetables or eggs or their meat that they're actually consuming. You know, and that's, and that's one of the things, too, that um, Dave and I talk about, and I'm sure you do, too. You know, know your farmer because you know the practices that they, um, they follow. Uh, right down to you know how they clean things you know um, mm-hmm. do they care about things like that or do they not care about things like that and and that also is going to then like you said spill over into the health of the food whatever it is that you're then consuming and, and a lot of people don't think about that they just I was totally guilty of this I will 100% admit it you know I just used to go to the grocery store and not think twice about how it actually got there or you know the 15 steps that it took to get there and not not counting the actual growing time or what it took to grow it, but you know all those other steps. And yeah, we don't we don't always think about that, and it definitely makes a big difference when you know the farmer. Yeah, and I I I think that the first step is knowing them by name, and then maybe it's asking. There, I think that the other tell of getting to know that person about whether their food is good or not, it, it goes like once you're able to relate to them and hear how they talk about how they grow and you know those little nuances that come up up in conversation um like you can almost get to a point where you don't need to even ask like specifics about like like um a soil test or a water test because you'll just you'll Mm -hmm. hear it in other ways as you get to know as you get to know the person and understand um their whys in their house um, well, I know the, what kind of wildlife we have here, um, and since you are more actually in the soil, uh, again, people don't think, I don't think people really understand how life actually is supposed to be in the soil. It's not literally just dirt. It's supposed to be living and breathing and full of all these organic things that are, you know, microbes and things that you can't see, but also bugs that you are supposed to be able to see. So what kind of... Um, wonderful wildlife do you see and we're really not that far removed from the city so i don't want people to think either that <laughs> yeah they see that because they're in the country well yes we're in the country but we're really not that far from the city so what kind of wildlife do you see or do you have in your area um well if i start at like the with the biggest ones like we we see some deer although i i like our property is pretty wide open and so i knock on wood i guess i i don't don't have to deal with a lot of deer damage in my crops um I do see some coyotes on occasion, um, so those would be the two big ones. And then I feel like the two types of animals we really have like noticed the biggest um, shift in who's here would be birds and insects. Um, and so I didn't mention earlier, but we have part of our acreage has the infrastructure to grow hops. So we have <laughs> from the road what looks like a lot of telephone poles out in our field. Um, and some high wires and stuff, which is like great area for birds to perch. So we get a lot of birds, um, a lot of hawks, unfortunately, because they also will eat chickens on occasion, but we have um, um, a few different species of hawks, cedar waxwings in the springtime or late winter, Mm, Um, cardinals, robins, of course. Um, There's a lot of starlings and um, that live basically year round here. They have found a nice nesting area in between our double-decker shipping container (laughs) stack so we have starlings all year round um and then in terms of insects i this last couple years i feel like there's been an explosion of praying mantises on the property oh that's the right plural of that insect but there's a lot of praying and i see a lot of their egg cases in our pasture um the praying mantis egg case looks like a tiny little it's like kind of football shaped and almost football colored and I see tons of those in our pasture um even where our chickens are now I I I saw about half a dozen the other morning um and then this summer for the first time in my hoop house I saw scarab beetles which I didn't I know they're in southern Wisconsin but I thought they'd be closer to like a moving waterway so I was surprised to see them around um and then a lot of lady beetles and other beneficial insects in our pasture as well as in, our, in my field. So, Well, that's good. It sounds like you definitely have a good little ecosystem going on, which is 
is good for when you're on a farm. You want to have a good ecosystem in right. above the soil and below the soil. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what kinds of um, advice would you give to somebody who's interested in re- in starting regenerative? Because uh, I know for us, we did, you said you have 20 acres. We only have just over an acre and a half. So you definitely don't need a lot of space. And I think that people kind of think that you have to have a lot of land or a lot of space. But what, what kind of uh, advice would you give to someone who maybe would want to start it? Um, depending on their context, I would say if you already have even a little bit of land available to you, just grow something. Just plant a seed <laughs> and start somewhere. Um, and then if, if you've already kind of decided that you think you would like to do it for a profession, like I would really encourage somebody to go work on another farm. Um, you may have to accept a lower wage than you might be getting now because it is a, it's not the highest paying work category. But I, for me, like the hands-on experience was the most, um, it was the best way for me to learn the, the how to do so that I had that foundation of like, I, co- I know what to plant when and ha- how to harvest. And so from, you know, like I can't really start a business until I know I'm going to have a product to sell. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, um, so for me, the hands-on experience was really important, but I also would just say like, don't, don't be afraid if it, or don't like judge yourself if it doesn't go as you think it, if you, it doesn't go right the first time where you end up with a product that's not what you thought it would be because every season is different. Every seed, even from the same packet is different. And so there's, there's, there's just more to learn. And, you know, the experience of something not coming into fruition the same way you thought it would, um, is just an opportunity to, to, rebound from and learn something and can and carry on and continue on um but i wholeheartedly agree with what you said where you don't need a lot of land you can grow a lot of you can grow a lot of food in a small space even you can even raise quite a bit of animals in a small space depending on um what your preference is for eating but um and the other part of it is like we don't have enough people doing this work um, at this scale, like if we really want to have more small scale food available to people, we need to have more people doing the work in whatever capacity they can. Well, and I know that you used to have a CSA and that's one great way that people can really get to know their farmer. Maybe you could tell my listeners, uh, cause until <laughs> only the last couple of years, I only learned then what a CSA was. So, um, and my aunt was looking for a CSA. She lives way in Port Washington now. Um, so otherwise I would have, um, mentioned you and, uh, so, but, um, maybe tell your, my listeners a little bit about what a CSA is and if there's a way that they can kind of find one in their area or suggest where they can find one in their area. Sure. So CSA as an acronym stands for community supported agriculture. Um, and it's a, it's a frame. It's like a, I guess I would call it like a sales framework for um, small farms to who want to have their produce go direct to the person who's going to eat it. Um, and generally, a CSA, well, the traditional CSA is usually a produce vegetable farm. Um, although there are more and more, there are, there's more and more ways that people do CSA, and depending on the farm, there might be eggs and meat or other add-on value-added products that are part of the program. Um, But the general way that it works is the farmer will um, offer, um, usually in our climate, it's 18 to 20 weeks of fresh fresh product um, for a fee that's paid in advance of the season. and so the idea is that the customer is offering cash to the farmer at a time of year where cash flow is usually low or non-existent um, so that they can make those pre-season investments in seed and inputs, um, staffing, um, their own living costs. And then in exchange for that upfront um, purchase, 
customers receive a share of the harvest throughout the growing season. And like I said, it's usually 18 to 20 weeks of harvest around here. Although with hoop houses and other um, simple technologies, farmers are able to offer more. You know, some farms will do a spring share where it's usually hoop house grown things. Some might do a storage share where they grow a lot of root crops and so they deliver through the end of the calendar year. It just depends on what the farm has decided works for their growing systems. Um, and the I, the other key part of it is that you're, the customers are paying for relationship with the farmer as well. And so there is expectation where the farmer will share not just what's going on on the farm, but you know how do you use the produce that's available? Why are these items available at this time of year and not other times of the year? Um, some farms will have on-farm events for the members so that they can get to know the farm um, in that, uh, like more directly. They can actually spend time on the farm and they can get to know other CSA members. Um, so it really is like trying to engage people in a season long journey alongside the farmer without having to do the labor, which <laughs> for a lot of people is a, is a great, a great way to be connected to their food and, the, and where it comes from. Um, so it's all about like, you know, reconnecting people to the source of, of what they eat. Um, and helping build a community around the farm too. So, um, yeah, I did it for one season. Uh, I had worked. I've worked on CSA farms in the past before I started my own business, and um, I was looking for a different way to bring some other income into the into my business. And I was starting to con like think about maybe moving away from the farmers market, not because I don't love it, but because. Um, you know, it was nice to dream about like, what would I do on weekends in the summertime if I didn't have to go to market? Um, but ultimately, um, I just found it was too much for me to manage, um, too many different income streams to manage. And um, I was also, I guess I got a little bit gun shy about that level expect of expectation that was, it was a new level of expectation for myself, like having to, um, you know, really keep people in the fold and keep them up to date. Like, I just, uh, at the time, didn't really have enough staff to help in the field to really be available for some of those things. So, but it's a it's, wonderful way for people that, you know, they they want to get their feet wet in, in the local agricultural scene, but they maybe don't have, you know, maybe weekends they're not available to go to the market or they like the convenience of, the way they, you know, a way that they kind of shop now, like CSA can really fold pretty easily into people's routines because usually the pro the farmer brings the produce into town for you to pick it up. You don't have to go to the farm. So mm -hmm. um, it is trying to, you know, meet, the farmer's trying to meet people where they're at with accessibility in that way too. Well, and the beautiful thing about a CSA too is it's it's local. It's not, you know, it's not sitting in a port somewhere or driving hundreds and hundreds of miles, you know, sitting in a, the back of a truck, you know, for long weekends. And it, it's local. Yeah. It's literally right around the neighbor. It's right around the corner or, you know, 20 miles away at the local farm. So it is really yeah. nice when, when you think about it like that, especially getting to know the farmer and you know what, what the practices are and everything. So I think it's, it's a good idea that people kind of get familiar or think about it. You know? Yeah, cool. yeah. I think it's a great option, and um, uh, the for CSAs that have been running for several years, like a lot of them will offer, you know, different options. Where if, if you're not a big vegetable eater, but you're you want to learn more, like a lot of them will have a smaller share option, or you can share it with another family. There are tons of options out there, and um, I guess to circle back, you also had asked like where people could look for more information or where they could find mm -hmm. CSAs around them. Um, here in the upper Midwest, um, maybe a little heavy on Wisconsin, but the Fair Share CSA Coalition, which is based out of Madison, they have a website um, that has a map of all the CSAs across the state. And, oh, well, not just the state, but all the CSAs that are part of their coalition. And so they're a nonprofit, but they help to kind of get the idea out to more consumers about CSA and what's available to them. And here, more even more locally, the Urban Ecology Center in Milwaukee 
you, I don't know if this event has come back post COVID, but they used to have a CSA open house in March of every year where they would invite CSA farmers to be present for a few hours on, I think it was a Saturday morning and people could come and um, talk to each individual farmer and hear about their CSA program. So you could f really find the one that works best for you. So that would be a local option to look into. I think the Farm Fresh Atlas of Wisconsin, which is a print publication that comes out, I think the new one usually comes out in June of every year, but even even a copy from this year would be a good pl starting place because there is, um, and that actually this, for 2024, that's gonna be a statewide, um, all farms across the state will be in the same paper version. Um, but they do in that um, Farm Fresh Atlas, Oh, or list, or I don't know if they list or farms can, there's like a, there's a little stamp on the farms that are SCSA, offer CSA as part oh, of great. their options. So oh, three that's good awesome. And I know that we've already touched on this a little bit, but um, you have chickens at your farm. And uh, we, Dave and I, had raised meat birds. This past year, unfortunately, we didn't do any, um, as many meat birds as we had in the past. Uh, this next year, we're going to do a few extra. But um, you have egg layers at your farm. We do. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I know that one of the struggles that um, uh, my husband and I ha had kind of faced is people don't really understand chickens very much. And again, I was totally guilty of this until we got in the, the space that we are. So maybe you could share what chickens actually eat with <laughs> my listeners. Because... <laughs> I think they just think that they just eat feed and that's it. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so in our case, our chickens are, so before we, before we started raising chickens, we put 10 acres of our land into perennial pasture. Um, and that pasture mix was a mix of a few different grasses, some forage brassicas, some legumes. Um, we had frost seeded it in March. So we, we, at that time we were sort of limited with seed that would germinate in cold temperatures. Um, and so from that mix, what I've seen chickens eat is any and all of it. <laughs> um, yeah. They seem to, they really do seem to sample just about any leaf that's at their height. Um, like I've seen them nibble on, well, really late in the fall, they'll even nibble on a thistle, like if it's the only green mm -hmm. thing left. Um, but I see them eat a lot of orchard grass, they do they really do like like alfalfa and the clovers when those are young and tender um they also really like to just scratch and kind of almost excavate around the roots of crop of um pasture plants so that they can find all the like the roly polies and the decomposing mm -hmm. decomposers that are at that in those root zones um after a good rain um all the chickens so we use a um portable fence to kind of create a pasture or a paddock and as we move our hens around the pasture and after a rain like they all line up and they walk the perimeter of the fence because that gets mowed a little bit lower so the fence doesn't short out and they walk the inside perimeter and they go after worms that are coming up for air after the rain so they love a good worm or two um caterpillars um i've even seen them like, you know, sometimes in the summer you kind of get those clouds of gnats that kind of fly mm -hmm. sort of low to the ground. Like, I have seen chickens leap up off of the ground to catch gnats, like mid-air. Um, grasshoppers, um, all kinds of beetles. I've seen them eat, you know, ground beetles, ladybugs. Um, and then we do also provide um, a, a feed ration that is mm -hmm. from a mill. Um, just because from our research and our experience, like if, if we want to maintain like a pretty high percentage of egg laying, we, we feel like we kind of have to provide some feed to keep that, that percent up. Um, our feed costs are pretty high, so it would be great if we could <laughs> pull back on that, but I'm not sure the trade-off of pulling back feed and getting less eggs would, would pencil out for us. <laughs> Yeah, I know a lot of people, um, just one one person in particular I'm thinking of, they were like shocked when I told them that chickens basically eat meat because they eat bugs a lot of mm -hmm. times and they love eating bugs and, you know, spiders, it didn't matter. 
And um, they were like, oh my gosh, they do. That's so gross. I'm like, yes, that's what they're, that's like one of their main things that they eat. You know, it's, it's not just yeah. before they're, they don't, they're not a hundred percent reliable on people. I mean, there is food out there. And like you said, they eat the grasses. They love our dandelions. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, may, this might be gross to people too, but in the winter time, um, like they're, I've seen them dig up mice out of, in the hoop house. Like they find mice mm-hmm. and they will, they'll eat a, a mouse too. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And I also give them like scraps and, um, share some of the farm harvest with them, like pumpkins and squash. They really, anything with a seed in the summertime, if we ha- ever come home with from market with too many cher- cherry tomatoes or something, those get shared with the chickens and they appreciate that. <laughs> Since you were talk- talking about that, I, it made me think of a question I was going to ask you earlier when we were talking about your farm and you were talking about um, compost and stuff. Um, some of the stuff I used to compost, I would give to the chickens first before I would put it out. Mm-hmm. Do you ever um, ask people like myself or your customers if they would donate some of their composting scraps to you guys? Do you guys need stuff like that? It sounds weird, but oh. I've seen people mm-hmm. that farms that actually are advertising that they want people's <laughs> composting scraps. Do you ever do that? Um, I get, we've never we've never asked our customers for that. That would be interesting to see what we might get. Um, we for a while we were picking up. Um, there's a kimchi maker on the south side of Milwaukee, and we were oh, picking yeah. up all of his like. You know, it was mostly like outer leaves of cabbage and carrot peelings and turnip peelings, and so mm-hmm. it was. Like it was great, um, it, especially in the winter time. It was great to have something fresh to give the, and something with more moisture in it to give the chickens. Um, yeah. And I don't remember why now we stopped picking it up. Um, we and for a while, my husband worked at a brewery in Milwaukee, and we were, he brought home some of the spent gr- the like brewery mash just to see how they would do because we you know I, I've worked on other farms that were using that as. Um, food for worms and I know people use it for food for cattle and I had read that you could feed it to chickens but they didn't really seem too into it so we just were composting that instead um but yeah I haven't not for a while we were getting a little bit of the scraps from one of the grocery stores locally like a lot like the Dale or in the you know collard greens and stuff that were past sale mm-hmm. but still edible for a chicken but um yeah, now I just kind of know that some of my like squash that I store for the winter will get shared with them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All I the also, ugly fruit that people don't want to pay money for. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, uh my mother who like when she was growing up her family raised a lot of chickens. She told me that her one of her t- tricks that her dad would do in the coldest part of winter when just to give him a little bit more um carbohydrate and fat to stay warm with he would actually give them lard <laughs> so <laughs> i i did try that one year when we had a really cold stretch because i had we had gotten half a pig earlier that year and i had a lot of lard and um they were into that too so <laughs> <laughs> they yeah. it's one of the things that's needed yeah yeah so um i know that you mentioned that you have the electrical fencing um because we used to move our chickens daily and i know that you have a lot of chickens so i know that you can't necessarily move them daily but um what kind of housing do you have for your egg layers yeah so over the years we've we've kind of figured out like how large of a paddock to make so that we give them about two weeks on each individual paddock um and they so they live in their coops are chopper boxes um which usually when i say that Lots of people don't know what I'm talking about. Um, it, if you picture like a, so four tires with a, like a wagon, and then it basically is like a four-sided metal box that at one time had like a system on it to like chop feed into straight up the field to take to to cattle or whatever. I, I've i never raised cattle, so I, <laughs> I don't, I've never used a chopper box for what it was designed for. But um, so my husband retrofitted those to, to for chickens. So in the inside we have wooden roosts for them to roost on at night and then um we have nest boxes that they lay their eggs into and the nest box design that we use um is a like a little bit of an angle so when they lay their egg it rolls down like out and away from where they're sitting 
um, mostly out of the way for where they can peck at it and play with it, but sometimes sometimes they get curious and they'll crack an egg here and there. Um, and those boxes, those chopper boxes, those mobile coops, we move with our tractor. And so about every two or three weeks, depending on the time of year, sometimes in summer we might have to move them more frequently. Um, sometimes, well, yeah, it just depends on the time of year and what's going on with the weather. Like if it's, if it's been wet, we might have to move them faster so that they don't um, like muck things up too much. Um, and so right now they're actually still on pasture because we haven't really had a ton of super cold weather yet. Um, so they're still outside. We try to keep them out in the pasture for as much of the year as possible. Mm -hmm. um, just because I think, you know, they're pretty curious and they, they want to move around. And so when it comes down to having them all in the hoop house, like I think they get kind of bored. And when they get bored, that's when they start like cracking eggs or pecking at each other or... So the, the more we can keep them outside and have and have room for them to explore, the better off everybody is. <laughs> Just being chickens, right? Exactly. Um, in your experience, what's like one of the more rewarding things about um, having egg layers? Um, I, well, I just think that chickens have like a lot of personality and like the, they're, they're so curious and they really are like, they're the best at like greeting every day, like the new day that it is, you know, it's like they come out of that coop every day and it's like, oh, I better check over here. I better check over there. You know, it's like, it doesn't matter that they've checked that yesterday, probably six times or, you know, they just, I don't know. There's something about their way that's just like, sort it's uplifting and it's positive and it's curious. And I think that those are good characteristics for everybody to <laughs> maintain as best as possible. Um, and then I also, I, I mean, I like having the the eggs here for our use and for, for sale and um, I, you know, it, it's just amazing to me how for a small animal, like what a nutritious food they can produce and um, uh, I like being able to offer that that protein to people too um and yeah it is a great cognitive multivitamin it's it's great for your brain so um yeah we love eggs so <laughs> we eat them lots um and and i know that um during the pandemic a lot of people started getting their own or raising their own egg layers so that they could have their own eggs um but if if you were to give someone advice about starting off what, what kind of simple tips or kind of tips would you give to someone for who wants to maybe start off or reasons why they should um i would say um gosh where were i would say you want to look into you want to consider how you're going to feed them like i would say figuring out how you're going to feed them is probably number one and knowing the best source of of the food and knowing that getting to know if the source is consistent because um, the last thing you want to do is have animals and not enough to feed them or no good source of no source of good food for them um i would also say like really think about how you're going to sell the eggs and consider that it's you can't turn them off. <laughs> so <laughs> once you once you have the chickens, you you know you're you're gonna have a continuous supply of eggs, and so you you want to know where those are gonna go. You, they have a shelf life, you know, they don't go bad immediately, but you don't want you don't really want them to pile up either. So really think about who, where they're gonna go, how they're gonna be used, who's gonna use them, how are you gonna get them to those people. Um, I also. If you're, if you think that you want to start at like a, a, you know, significant scale, maybe more than, more than enough chickens to have more eggs than just your own household, I do think it's also worth figuring out that, or remembering that chickens are most productive depending on the breed. Like two years is about the maximum that they're really going to be productive in the, in a lot of the commercially available breeds. Some of the heritage breeds will go longer. I think that I've read you know, a chicken can live to be about six years old. Um, she's probably not laying an egg every day at that age, but um, but you do want to consider 
what happens to your chickens once their egg production starts to go down. So either being prepared to process yourself or know how they're where they're going to go. Um, because um, in the way that I think egg production has evolved, you know, as agriculture has evolved and gotten bigger and less small producers are out there, um, there's sort of a, there's not a, there's sort of a lack of options of like, um, there's not many people who can call up to be like, I have a hundred hens that I aren't laying anymore. Like, what do I do with, you know, will you process mm -hmm. them? There aren't, there's not a lot of options out there for that. So, um, you just want to consider that. And, you know, I think it's beautiful if you can bring it full circle and, you know, gracefully process that hen and, and enjoy her in a different way. Um, but you, you also have to be willing and ready to pre prepared for that. So, <laughs> yeah, well, and I had not thought about that either because, Again, we've done meat birds, so they only live a certain amount of time, and then we take them to be processed, and then we eat them. But, yeah, yeah, when you have an egg layer, especially if you just have, you know, let's say two of them or four of them for your own personal use, okay, they stop laying, then, yeah, what do you do with it? So I don't, I don't think that people always think about that kind of stuff. So that's probably a very good thing that you recommended that they think about that now so that they don't have to worry about it later. <laughs> as to yeah, yeah, just have a plan. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Maybe they'll just want to keep it as a pet. So, cuz like you said, they are very they can be very funny and mm -hmm. uh yeah, they have a lot of personality. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the thing I like about your farm too, which you recently started implementing is um you also have bees now as well. Yeah. And so, you kind of have like this good, like I said, this great little ecosystem on your farm. You know, and, and maybe someday you'll have more hops as well. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you have a good little ecosystem. So what inspired you guys to start doing beekeeping for honey? Was it just for the beekeeping you wanted to do it? Or was it for the honey originally? Or how did that start? Um, I think a couple of things. Like uh, my, my mother raised bees when she was young. And so I grew up like hearing these. And she's like wildly allergic to them. So I grew up hearing these stories about her beekeeping and like, so I think when I got around that age that she was when she was keeping bees, I was like, well, if she can do it, I can do it too. Um, so I think that was part of it. And then I also, um, I for the last several years, I I don't have a I don't have a propagation greenhouse on our farm um, as of yet, although that's in the works right now. Um, so I've been work trading at another family farm to have access to their greenhouse to start seedlings in the spring and. Um, it's a father son that run that farm and the father he um he a few years back well the first year i worked for him he had started keeping bees and so i was doing a little bit of like prep work for the hives in late winter for him and and then he like kind of more or less just like put two packages of bees in the back of my van one day when i was out there and was like oh you can keep bees <laughs> and i had i had helped a little bit with bees at uh, some farms i worked at like a decade ago um so like i had done the installation i had done the honey harvest i didn't really do any of the work in between so um um i you know i i didn't really know what it would take to keep bees but i knew that you know, the honey that you get at the end is totally worth it, how, whatever it takes to get there. Um, and I and I felt like knowing how to install a hive is like the most important part, right? It's like you get the bees and you know what to do with them once they're here, or you know how to get them in their hive at least. <laughs> um, so that's kind of how I got started. Like the equipment was kind of given to me at an affordable price. The bees were put in my van and um, <laughs> so I was kind of thrown into it. And the first I still like, I still kind of feel like I have a lot to learn. Um, I've also learned that I am pretty allergic to them or res respond pretty <laughs> severely when I get stung. Um, so that I'm actually, a, I'm a little hesitant to work with them right now. And I think that I'm, my impression of bees that they, is that they are very good at sensing the mm. mood and the energy of the beekeeper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I think this year's hives knew that I was afraid, <laughs> a little bit afraid of them. Um, so that I just need to do some more research so I can be better empowered to get out there. And I'll, I also bought a new pair of gloves, which I think should help with the stinging situation. Um, but um, 
yeah, last year we had a pretty success. We had our first successful harvest last year. We we got about seven and a half gallons. I can't remember what that works out to in pounds, but we oh, had enough money that we were able to share with, give some away for Christmas to all of our friends and our family, and then we sold a little bit here on the farm, and then we had enough for our own honey needs um, up until I just like a couple weeks ago purchased some honey because we have not yet spun this year's harvest. Um, I, I'm always, I feel like I, the bees work a little bit faster than I can keep up with them. Um, so I got to strategize for next year and how I'll create the time <laughs> to make sure that I give them what they need in advance so that I'm not so behind the curve. Because um, what I've l kind of learned is that I, you know, I kind of think of peak peak season in terms of vegetables as like August and September. So I, in my mind, I was sort of following that with like how I basically what I've learned is like, you need to keep, you need to like the beekeeper is in charge of maintaining or adding space so that, so that the colony can continue to grow and grow in numbers and bring in more honey and all that. So when I was picturing like peak season being August and September, I'm actually like behind the curve with bees because their peak season is more like June, July when mid June, early July when um, there's the greatest variety of flowering plants around us. So that's interesting too. Yeah, I would not have thought about that. Yeah, I don't. I never thought in terms of like pollen production and flower production. It's just it's just a different thing to attune myself to <laughs> well and then i would imagine that um once they like you said june and july okay so once is that when you then would harvest it and then if they build more so then you have to do it again it depends it, it depends on the strategy that you want to employ like i kind of feel like what i've learned that there's a couple of different ways people keep bees in a general sense and um one is like you as soon as you start seeing activity in the spring although i'm still seeing a lot of activity now on some of these you know days that are in the mid 40s i still see bees coming out and they haven't really like gone to rest for the the year yet so one strategy is like early in the spring as soon as you see activity and you know like they're kind of awake again and you if you notice nothing's really flowering then you can start to feed bees and there's a different ways of you can you can buy feed you can make feed you like sugar water for bees. I I have just been keeping, like after we spin our honey, we have kind of this mishmash of honey and comb, and it's like it has too much comb in it to really eat, <laughs> and it has too much honey in it to just you know toss it. So I was cutting that into like patties and putting it between two pieces of um, parchment paper, and then just like slipping those packages into the hive and feeding feeding the bees that so it you can start to feed them as soon as you see they're active if nothing's blooming and then once you are able to go in the hive and see like who's there what stages of development are there is it all worker bees or do you see are they starting is the queen starting to lay you know the next generation that helps you give you an indication on um how quickly the hive is growing and you can also then visually can see like are there open cells in the frames is there room for more bees is there room for more food or is everything kind of full and do they need more space um and then you can decide if it's do you give them space to grow in population or do you give them space to make more honey once they've started to to stock away the honey you can you can either add more honey boxes and then that when some beekeepers do that and that's when you see like these hives that are you know stacked 10 feet tall because their strategy is just to keep giving a new honey box um the farmer that i kind of am learning some things from he do, he does a little bit of that but then part of his strategy too is like he has empty em empty honey boxes so that rather than have this great big stack that's like you know you have to be on a ladder to harvest from late in the season um he'll just pull empty frames of honey and put in or he'll pull a full frame out of the hive and put in an empty frame so that okay. you're yeah they they want work to do it's kind of similar to chickens like and maybe all livestock to some degree it's like because you're keeping them for your purpose like maybe some of their natural purpose is 
irrelevant to some degree, so you have to pro kind of provide the work for them and provide them the space to do their work. So, yeah, there's different ways to think about it, and um, I'm still learning there, too. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's definitely a lot to think about, too, because I hadn't thought about that. I was just thinking how, well, and I would like to have some bees on my property way in the back or far away from the house. But, um, yeah, I would want someone to come and tend it. I just want someone else to do it. I, I'm not even, maybe give me a jar of honey now and again, but <laughs> I just would would like to have it for more, you know, bees, that, yeah. you know, to help them. But, yeah, I don't, I don't want to deal with the work of <laughs> doing it they can do that <laughs> yeah yeah it, it can be kind of intimidating for sure and I, I I'm not entirely happy with where I've chosen to put our bees because it's very close to our clothesline and so <laughs> oh. some days hanging out the clothes on a day where the bees are active is more of a <laughs> more of a feat than it needs to be <laughs> oh no <laughs> oh goodness well, that's the day that your husband has to hang the, the clothes on. Right, yeah. Or do it early before the bees are up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so glad that you got a chance to be on. I know that your farm's name is Amy's Acre. Um, why don't you tell my listeners what your website is and um, where they can find you on Instagram? Yeah, my uh, farm website is amysacre.com. On the website, you'll find like the farmer's markets that I sell at. You'll, sell, you'll find the restaurants that I sell to. And there's also a contact me page where you can reach out directly and... Um, I try to post regular updates on there about what's going on with our on-farm stand um, because we do sell product right off the farm. Right now we just have eggs for sale. Um, I didn't do a lot of fall crops this year, so just eggs for the winter. Um, and then my um, Instagram account is at Amy's Acre Farm. Before we go, I always ask my listener or um, my guest to tell my listener um, what their don't miss this moment would be. So if you want my listeners to get like one thing from our conversation, what would that be? What would that takeaway be? Hmm. Um, I think if, you know, if, if this inspires you to learn about what's going on in agriculture where you are, like, go out and meet a farmer and then just, and be curious. Like, don't be afraid to ask the question that goes, you know, like, whatever your true question is that you want to know, even if you think it's silly, like, just ask, um, because... Um, you never know what sort of wealth of information door you'll open and where it will lead. So allow yourself to be curious and learn more about the food that's being grown closest to you. Great. That's a great advice. I like it. And I definitely liked your uh, thought of, um, you know, just plant one seed and just try it. You know, if you don't like it, that's okay. You don't, you know, try something else. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, written. well, thanks. Thanks again so much for being on today, Amy. I really appreciate you taking the time. And um, I am coming to get some of those eggs within the next handful of days because we need some anyway. So All right. <laughs> thanks again. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Pendulum Probiotics is a powerhouse in gut wellness. Acromancia, Metabolic Daily, and Glucose Control all contain Acromancia, which is a key player in gut health. It fosters the growth of Acromancia, aiding in digestion, nutrient absorption, immune resilience, and a positive impact in your overall well-being. If you're ready to experience Pendulum Probiotics, unlock an exclusive 20% discount on your first month's membership by entering my unique code when you click on the Linktree link in the show notes. If you want to continue learning and hearing all things nutrition for your mind, body, and spirit, click like, subscribe, or favorite me on whatever podcast platform you use. Or you can find me at ForgivenNutritionist.com. This podcast was designed to educate, inspire, and empower you to achieve your health and wellness goals with your current health care provider. It is not meant to diagnose or treat any illness or medical condition or take the place of any treatments from your current health care providers.